Hi, my name is Jason Rustein. I'm a plastic surgeon here at UCLA specializing in aesthetic surgery, and I'm here to talk to you about facial rejuvenation. First, I want to go over what the process is of facial aging, what's involved with it. Then I want to talk about what we can do about it, and there's both non-surgical options and surgical options. Lastly, I want to go over some latest advances and then go over some common myths that my patients have. So what happens to the face as we age? It really goes from skin all the way down to bone. In the skin, we notice a loss of collagen thickness, and this is where you start to see more fine wrinkles, and we also see a loss of elastin. And elastin is a substance that allows your skin to kind of stretch out and then bounce back. So as we age, it stretches out, but it doesn't bounce back as well. Then we also see a loss in redistribution of facial fat. What you'll see is the kind of loss of volume around the cheeks and uh, more uh, gaining of fat around the jawline. So you get go from a more heart-shaped face to a more square-shaped face. And part of that is, is also the role of gravity. And we, over time, lose some of the support for our facial uh, soft tissues. So the fat is allowed to migrate lower. And lastly, even the facial bone structure changes. And this is something we rarely change operatively, but it becomes that much more important to add often volume to a face and uh, resupport things. So here is a, a diagram of basically one side of the face that's youthful compared to one that's age. And there's, there's a common thing that uh, I want to point out. And if you follow this line here of the youthful face versus the age face, you can see there's, the line is more straight and more convex. And what that is, there's a smoothness to the youth that you lose it as, as we age and we see compartmentalization. That's probably most prevalent here around the eyes where you see compartmentalization, a separation of the eye from the cheek, and what we call a lid-cheek junction uh, shows up. But uh, that, that can also be seen throughout the face as shown and in, in diagrammed here. And there's a whole laundry list of things that happen as we age, uh, but kind of going from top to bottom, um, you notice the brow, we get some hair recession and the brow becomes longer, so that becomes an important point if we're ever going to do something like a brow lift. We don't want to raise that hair further back. You, of course, see some wrinkles and deeper wrinkles forming around the forehead. Then as the, the forehead kind of descends, it shows up here in what's called um, a lateral hooding, and that's seen right here, and that's something we often want to address. A lot of excess eyelid skin that shows up and then sometimes some extra fat here especially in the medial aspect of the upper eyelid. And then in the lower, uh, lower lid, as I pointed out, you get that compartmentalization, what's called a tear trough, and a, a separation between the lid and the cheek, as well as descent of the lower lid and um, excess skin. Then what we see is the cheek pad seems, tends to fall over time, and this causes a deeper nasolabial crease in what's called a marionette line. And then down at the jawline, again, you get that what's called a jowl. And again, if you look at the youthful face, it's more heart-shaped. There's, there's more volume up by the cheeks, and it kind of tapers down in a nice, clean jawline. And you kind of get more of a squared-off look with uh, aging. Now that we know, you know what the facial aging process involves, what could we do about it? And, and again, there's both non-surgical options and surgical options. The non-surgical options is three mainstays. There's Botox, fillers, and skin resurfacing. A lot of patients get the Botox and fillers uh, confused, so I'm going to go over that in, in some detail. In terms of sur surgical options, there's the brow lift, upper lid blepharoplasty, which is a fancy word just doing upper eyelid surgery, lower lid blepharoplasty, same idea, just the lower eyelid, and of course the facelift and neck lift. So what are the pros and cons of each? So non-surgical options in general tend to have less downtime. They tend to be less expensive per treatment, although they require maintenance and therefore often multiple treatments to get your desired goal or, and or over time needing to repeat it. The results tend to be more limited compared to surgery and we can't um, get as dramatic of a result. And in general, they do tend to be lower risk. And, but however, the, it's important to keep in mind they're not always a solution. I'm in this talk going to try to uh, emphasize when, you know, when uh, surgery is necessary. So surgical options, obviously there's more uh, downtime. You know, it takes at least weeks to recover. It's a one-time bigger investment, but again, if you add up the, the, between the maintenance and multiple treatments, often they're about equivalent. There's the ability to give a significant more improvement in result. That doesn't mean a done look by any means, but it does mean that there's, there's a more, um, uh, more noticeable and nicer change that is relatively permanent. Of course, that does come with some greater risk. Um, however, it is mandatory for certain regions. And probably the, the biggest area that we can't solve with non-surgical options thus far is skin excess. 
So of course, people don't want to look like this. So this is what I consider um, examples of what's a done look. Um, however, you know that's that's not necessary. I think its ability, uh, it's possible to get natural looking uh, plastic surgery. And it's important to to keep in mind that you only notice bad plastic surgery. A lot more a lot more people out there have had plastic surgery than you emphasize. This is an example of a patient of mine that I think had a, a relatively natural looking result. But I think communication is key in getting across to to um, your doctor, what you're trying to achieve is very important, so you guys are both on the same page. And every surgery should really be individualized for the uh, patient. What you're trying to achieve um, is, is uh, not always necessarily possible, and so again, the communication is important. But uh, each person requires their own treatment plan. And of course, it's really important to maintain healthy habits always, not only to make any treatment safe, but also so you, get to, so you can uh, further preserve the results. So now I'm going to go over some non-surgical options. I'm going to start with Botox. So what is Botox? It's, it's a naturally derived uh, protein um, taken actually from a bacteria. It's been FDA approved since uh, 1980. So we have about 35 years of medical experience with it. And basically what it does is it temporarily decreases muscle activity. It essentially paralyzes muscles locally. Of course, in a large dose, this could be lethal, but we we are one one thousandth of that dose uh, typically for cosmetic reasons. So it's it's... Uh, not even a, a worry in any way. Um, but basically, it softens and, and or eliminates what's considered dynamic wrinkles, wrinkles that you get uh, with uh, expression. Uh, and this is most uh, common around the forehead, around the eyes, and in, in what's called the 11s here, in, in uh, medically called the glabella. Um, it also has a role for preventing and worsening the creation of wrinkles, which is important to keep in mind. Most people want to know how much it costs. In general, with an MD injector, uh, the average, it ranges you know, from uh, 10 to $20 per unit, but the average out there is about $15 a unit. At UCLA, we do it by region, where it's about $400 for the first region, $250 for the second, and $150 for the third. So if you're treating multiple regions, it actually saves you money per, per, um, as you treat more regions. So this is just a diagram of how Botox works here. This is a muscle that's in your forehead called the frontalis, and this goes vertically. And that's basically why we get those vertical forehead uh, uh, wrinkles. And what we do is by paralyzing that muscle, we're able to achieve this type of result um, where you, you can get rid of what that, that wrinkle that's caused by this um, forehead muscle going vertically. These uh, are caused by muscles called the corrugators here. Uh, and again, this is the type of result you can expect with Botox when you paralyze the muscle. So some of the top questions I get regarding Botox, when will I see the results? The results aren't immediate for, with uh, Botox. They don't even start till about three to four days, and the full effect isn't about till one to two weeks. So if you're going to have a, um, a party or something you want to look your best, I'd try to plan it about two weeks ahead. Um, how long do the results last? They last three to four months. However, one, one thing I like to keep in mind your skin will forever see the benefits of that, that three to four month break. So, so while they consider it um, uh, temporary, it, uh, it does last um, forever in that, in that respect. Is there any downtime? Not really. There can be some mild bruising at worst, but, uh, and you, you'll, you'll see what looks like a mosquito bite initially, but that goes away within hours, and the mild bruising usually is, is uh, very minimal and, and done by the uh, next day, and you could cover it with makeup that night. Does eliminate um, all wrinkles? As I said, it, it works best on what's called dynamic wrinkles, wrinkles that form from expression. So anything that you have at rest when your face is totally relaxed, it will tend to soften them, but not completely elim eliminate it. So here are just a couple examples of Botox before and afters. Here's one, you could see the improvement in the forehead. So fillers. Um, they're an injectable substance that adds volume to areas under the skin to smooth depressions. So it's not working on muscles in any way, and it can literally fill any part of the face. There's both permanent and non-permanent. Most, the most common and popular is non-permanent uh, filler that's made of something called hyaluronic acid. And hyaluronic acid, the way to think about it, your, your cells in your body aren't sitting in thin air. They're sitting in a, in a, a sea, and that sea is primarily composed of hyaluronic acid. So what are the most common regions we treat with this area? Um, the most common would probably be the nasolabial fold here. People don't like that depression. Uh, another very common region is that cheek, like I mentioned before. Um, 
you want to try to add volume to that area because of the loss with the aging, and it gives you more of that heart-shaped face. Uh, a lot of people want more volume in their lips, and especially with aging, you do lose some uh, volume in your lips, and that's a good uh, way to, to add volume. And again, it doesn't have to look done. It can still look natural, and I'll try to give you some examples of that. There's also um, the uh, tear trough um, area that we do treat with fillers and try to um, get that uh, improved. Um, the skin is very thin there, and it's an area that, um, that uh, can be more visible in terms of the filler with any irregularity, so it's important to keep that aligned in mind. And a lot of people like to get it along the jawline uh, as well to, to smooth out the jawline, and that has to be done selectively. Again, the whole process of aging is where you add, where there's increased volume kind of with descent along the jawline, so adding extra volume there often isn't the right idea, and you may be a better candidate for something like a facelift. How much does the procedure cost? The filler costs anywhere from about $500 to $1,000, depending on the exact type of filler. Uh, for instance, Restlin tends to be closer to $500, and Voluma is closer to $1,000, but the Voluma lasts a lot longer than the Restlin, and that's the reason it has the increased cost. So what are some of the most common questions I get, get regarding fillers? When do I see the results? Compared to Botox, which takes three to four days, you really will get the result immediately. And if anything, it tends to swell in those first few days, so it'll be a little bit exaggerated for the first few days, uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, uh, smooth out. But immediately, when, um, what we see is what we get, essentially, with the fillers. How long do the results last? Um, they last anywhere from six months to two years, depending on the, the region uh, and the type of filler used. The downtime, there can be some bruising uh, and swelling. Uh, again, you could cover this uh, makeup uh, with makeup the night of. Um, and uh, again, there, the result can be a little bit exaggerated for the first couple of days. Uh, does it eliminate all wrinkles? Um, yes, it does, but it works better in certain regions, as I tried to point out. So like the nasolabial folds and the cheeks are probably the best. And then you, it can selectively be used under the eyelids or along the jawline. Here's some before and afters of what uh, the smile lines look like but, uh, before and after uh, fillers. Another name for the smile lines are nasolabial folds. This is a lip filler, and you can kind of see a, a gradation of increasing filler, and you can kind of stop there if that suits you, or you can keep going. And, of course, we have all these options. And one thing that's important to keep in mind is that the hyaluronic acid filler is reversible. So if you feel like something's overdone, it can always be reversed, and I think that's a huge um, selling point on, uh, regarding that filler and why that's the preferred type of filler in my practice. Uh, it's rare that we ever have to reverse it because most... Um, you know, 95 to 99% of our patients are happy with the placement of the filler, but worst case scenario, it's an option. Here's another example of lip filler before and after, and again, it doesn't have to look done. Lastly, I want to touch on a, a product that's um, just got FDA approved uh, late 2013 uh, that's specifically for the cheek, and this one is the one that's a little bit more expensive, but it lasts for two years, and I think um, patients have been really hap happy with it. It costs $1,000 per cc, and what it does, it gives you more of that heart shape um, to the cheek region. And so it's a very powerful and effective tool for that. I've had some great success with it. Uh, last uh, non-surgical option I want to talk about for facial rejuvenation is skin resurfacing. So its role is really to work on, on the surface of the skin and reduce fine lines and wrinkles. Um, it gives you an improvement in texture and color. And there's really three basic options. There's the chemical peels, laser treatment, and dermabrasion. They all essentially do the same thing. And really, it, it's the depth of the, um, the option that, that determines the result. And with increasing depth, though, however, there's more downtime. So, so they all, whether it's a chemical burn or a heat burn with lasers, they end up having the same uh, result. And it just depends on, on the particular patient what the best option is. I'd say in general, when you're doing a full face, it's a lot quicker and easier to do a chemical peel on what I prefer, especially if we're in the operating room anyways uh, during a facelift. Uh, and for the perioral rhytids, these rhytids, um, I get the best results with the dermabrasion because I could really tailor it the best uh, compared to chemical peels or laser treatments. So this is an example of a TCA chemical peel. Uh, again, you could see a, a nice reduction in the amount of fine lines between the before and after. Um, and uh, improved texture and coloring, and also got rid of some of the pigmentary issues for her. This is a dermabrasion before and after, again, used for the perioral rhytids, um, and uh, a, a nice uh, change for her. 
So some of the things to consider, especially when it comes to non-surgical options, there's a, there's a lot of practitioners there out there that are uh, practicing this. I even seen some dentists um, offer uh, Botox and and uh, and fillers, and I, I think you know just be careful out there. Um, get what you pay for, and uh, try to read reviews and and uh, look up people's credentials. And ideally, it would be a plastic surgeon, uh, facial plastic surgeon, or a dermatologist. Um, at the minimum to do these uh, non-surgical options. So I'm going to go over some of the surgical options we have for facial rejuvenation. I'm going to kind of do from a top to bottom approach. So with that, I'm going to start with the brow lift. And what it does is surgically elevates the brow line. It can, alter, it, it can also be used to alter the muscle to prevent wrinkles. However, in this day and age with Botox, I generally try to avoid that because it's no longer necessary. And I think the results are better with Botox. However, it's very effective for reducing the amount of what's called the lateral hooding there. And a lot of people think that that's just excess eyelid skin, but it really isn't. This is your brow, and what you could see is that as you age, the brow gets uh, brought down and descent, uh, descends, um, and you want to put it back up in a more youthful position. And with that, when you do that, it gets rid of some of that excess skin that hangs down there, um, lateral to the eyelid. Um, how is this done? The, the nice thing about it is, is, in general, incisions are all hidden in the scalp. In most cases, with someone with a nice low hairline, we could put it far back into the scalp and it's really well hit, hidden. And someone with, who may have too high of a uh, hairline and, and, uh, and or excess uh, forehead, we can even try to use uh, this approach, a uh, hairline approach, to reduce the um, distance between the brow and the forehead. So somebody with a really high hairline, you don't want to put it up higher because that makes them look more aged. You actually can take this opportunity to drop it down a little bit. It's, it's done in, in general uh, in the operating room under general anesthesia. Sedation would be uh, effective. Um, however, it's often combined with other procedures and, and general anesthesia is preferred. By itself, it is an outpatient procedure, but if we do it with a facelift, um, we do recommend an overnight stay. Recovery and downtime for almost all the surgical procedures is going to be one to two weeks for bruising and um, about four to six weeks for swelling. This will be a common theme. Um, no need to keep repeating it, but essentially um, that's what you can expect. Here's a brow lift before and after. It's a patient of mine um, that uh, has, again, you can see the preoperative lateral hooding here, uh, and then a nice, nicer, uh, smoother um, smoothness to, that, to the lateral hooding. She actually had no upper eyelid surgery. This is just the brow lift. Um, and then you can see the tail of the... Um, the brow here in a better position. You want to have that above what's called the bony rim. Here it's at the bony rim, and here it's about a centimeter above where the bony rim is. So it's a, it's a nice result for her. She also had a facelift, however. Here's another view of the same patient. Um, again, kind of concentrate on this area here, and that's kind of what we're addressing with the brow lift. And again, you could see a more nicer um, contour to her overall uh, brow. Upper lip blepho blepharoplasty is uh, surgery for the upper eyelid to eliminate the excess skin and or uh, fat that uh, some people have here. You could see excess skin. Now this is different than the lateral hooding that extended all the way out here. It's centered right over the eye. And then here, very commonly, people have uh, what's called a medial fat pad excess. And we have that opportunity to uh, get rid of some of that excess fat that hangs down. So this does help open up the eyes. Um, it can even be... Uh, uh, help improve in vision. Uh, if you have so much excess skin, sometimes it can hang over the the, uh, the um, uh, eyelashes and, and it inhibit your vision. And that, in those cases, it may actually be coverable by insurance if it's if it's severe enough. But that is pretty uh, rare. This is the one procedure that you can do under local only. Um, if we're doing it as an isolated procedure, it don't does not require a trip to the operating room, which saves you the the cost associated with that. And uh, um, the patients do very well just under local. Um, again, uh, it's an outpatient procedure and the recovery and downtime, um, you, could have, you could expect some bruising in uh, one to two weeks in the swelling, you know, about four weeks in, in this particular case. And have an example of a patient at just one week and um, you could see some of the bruising, even though we operate on the upper eyelid, it kind of tracks down into the lower eyelid. Uh, but it looks fairly presentable just at, at uh, one week. Uh, and uh, got his eyes opened up and um, a nicer contour and more youthful appearance to his eyes. Here's some other examples. Um, this is a, a female. This is uh, um, about three months to six months after uh, surgery. 
um, and you can see the improvement in the uh, upper eyelid skin in both the uh, female at the top and the, the male in the, uh, in the bottom. I'm going to talk about lower lip blepharoplasty, uh, which is basically uh, rejuvenating the lower lid. Uh, it's an opportunity to remove both excess skin and or fat of the lower eyelid, very, very similar to the upper eyelid. Uh, it can get more complicated than the upper eyelid and in general does require uh, an operating room uh, under general anesthesia. Um, our goals generally is to soften the bags under the eyes um, and uh, uh, reduce the visibility of, of that tear trough and then um, also tighten often the uh, lower lid skin and or the, just the, the, um, uh, uh, the rim of the uh, lower eyelid. Um, in general, the incisions are all hidden in the lower lid. They can be uh, within the eye um, or behind the skin of the eye. Um, and even when we do have to remove some skin, that skin heals better than any other skin in the body and it basically is a scarless surgery. Very similar to the upper eyelid, actually. Um, I forgot to mention that the upper eyelid skin heals extreme, extremely well, um, and it's very difficult to ever see that scar uh, because it heals so well. Um, again, the recovery and downtime is about one to two weeks for bruising and four to six for swelling. And here's a couple examples of just a younger patient who just had excess fat in the lower eyelid, and that was removed from within the eye. Uh, so there's no, absolutely no visible scar and uh, a, a nice result. Here's an older patient who had excess skin. Um, here you could see and, and uh, required the uh, skin surgery. But, but again, it's impossible to see that, that scar, uh, even with the magnifying glass. Here's a patient that uh, had both the upper and uh, lower lid uh, surgery. Um, and uh, in this case, this is uh, only six weeks post-op, so the scar is slightly visible. So it's good to see this as an example. One thing I like to point out, this patient did have quite a bit of lower uh, um, lateral hooding, but notice she had her eyebrows tattooed and, and the tattoo artist put it up pretty high already, so that we don't want to elevate that more than it already was. So in this case, I had to kind of extend the upper eyelid incision and, I, and if anything, pull it down a little bit. So I was able to get rid of that lateral hooding and then put the eyebrow in, in a, a better position. And then it, in the lower eyelid, you can notice she had a little bit of excess fat in it. Um, and that, uh, that separation between her lid and cheek uh, and the uh, deeper tear trough, and you could see a, a nice improvement there. Here's a close-up view of the same thing. Again, notice the, the tear trough and the uh, lid-cheek junction that, that is uh, improved. And here's a male patient. Um, again, strong lid, long distance between his uh, lower eyelid and the uh, cheek and a big separation on both sides. And shortening that distance is an important part of the facial rejuvenation process as well. He also had his upper eyelids done. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about face and neck lifts. Um, what, is it, what is it? It's a repositioning of the face uh, and neck, soft tissues and muscles. Um, and a lot of people think of it just treating the skin and pulling the skin really tight, but really it's, um, uh, it's all done. The, the secret to a good face lift is uh, treating all the tissues deep to the skin, repositioning them back in the, the right position, and, and often adding volume to it. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, and then trimming, just trimming the excess skin. The last thing you want to do is use skin to, to uh, get your result because, number one, it, it, uh, uh, tension on scars causes worsening of scars and causes them to widening, widen. And the result for skin is very temporary. Um, skin is a, a uh, elastic structure that's, that's meant to stretch. Uh, so it just gives a temporary result. And when you see that really pulled look, that, that's uh, often a telltale of a, a, a skin lift uh, only facelift. And this was a procedure they, they did, and this is where facelifts all started. And, and um, I think what often gives facelifts a bad name and a done look is that it was a skin lift only facelift. Um, and, uh, and it wasn't the all the structures deep to the skin weren't treated uh, uh, adequately. And, and what do I mean by that? I, the things that we can treat with it, we can elevate the cheek. Uh, we can, with that, uh, soften the smile lines. Um, most importantly, we can really help with the jawline and get rid of what were called the jowls, and then, of course, improve the necklines significantly as well. Um, the recovery and downtime, again, it's one to two weeks for bruising. The swelling does last a little bit longer. In a facelift, we see you know pretty significant swelling about six weeks, but a lot of people like that swollen look. So 
Uh, I'll show you a couple examples of early results and then some later ones as well. Um, most importantly, a lot of people are worried about the scars of facelift, and they're really well hidden, and that, scar that, that tissue also scars really well, but basically they're in the hairline, and use the natural anatomic uh, uh, marks of your ear to pretty much make the incision very difficult to see. Um, this is a post-operative result of a, of a facelift, and again, it's very difficult to see any of the scars. This is a patient of mine just 10 days post-op, just to give you an idea now. She did wear some makeup to cover any uh, bruising, so keep that in mind, but uh, otherwise she looked fairly presentable. Now, this is not something I promise, but uh, just this is an actual patient of mine, so it, does, it is a real example, but um, you know, I'd say for anything, uh, any important engagement, ideally you'd give yourself really four to six weeks uh, before um, or at following the procedure uh, to make sure you're ready for it, uh, but you can be presentable as soon as two weeks. And you could see again, really nice improvement in the uh, neckline. Here's a closer up view of that. The other thing I like to point out from this particular surgery is she actually had a prior facelift and this is a poorly placed scar that was, was likely a skin lift only and that's why it's a little bit widened and more visible and way too anterior and then she had loss of what's called your natural ear uh, tragus. So this is an example of what we're not trying to achieve and this at 10 days you can see where the scar is nicely placed now in the in the ear crease and uh, we have reformation of what um, of her tragus and uh, she went on to heal fantastically. Here's another example of a face and neck lift. Um, again, gives you the opportunity to dramatically improve the uh, neckline. This is nothing you could ever achieve with any non-surgical options. Um, I really like, like this example because you can see what, what the face lift really does and how we are able to remove this much SS skin. If you look at the, the mole here, you could see how it moved all the way behind the ear there. So it's a great example like that. And then you could see a much improved neckline where she had a lot of what we call submental fat and we're able to directly excise that with surgery and give her this nice clean uh, neckline. And I think all these examples, I think they still look like themselves, but just an improved version of, of themselves um, is the uh, other view. Here's a patient that was massive weight loss actually and had a lot of excess skin of the neck here. And we're, um, she's a, a lot of the massive weight loss patients are ideal candidates for, for uh, this procedure and we're able to get rid of all that excess skin and, and she was uh, very happy with this result. Um, this is an example of a patient that was you know, quite el elderly in, in her late 70s. Um, I like this as an example because she didn't have any skin resurfing procedures, um, but uh, you could see the nice improvement and smoothness to her skin that she was able to achieve post-operatively, um, and as well as a, uh, a nice result of all this excess and hanging skin, and um, she was very happy and uh, uh, was, uh, you know, noticed this nice incre uh, improvement in her skin as well, which uh, I'd like to show this picture for. And this, this, uh, Another example of a patient of face and neck lift. Again, she had a very full neck and we're able to give her a much nicer uh, neckline. She also had her upper lids done, uh, which uh, helped the overall. A lot of times you have to address the whole face and it becomes important during the consultation that we talk about that and, and you don't want to have a piecemeal face. We have to individualize the approach for you and try to get the, the best uh, result we can. Another view of the same patient, just again, a very full neck and gave her a much nicer uh, neckline. Scan another patient of mine. This is a neck lift only. This is a younger uh, patient um, who uh, was mostly just bothered by her neck and she had what we call platysmal bands um, that you could see there. And uh, we we're able to address those and give her a uh, much nicer appearance. You can see the platysmal bands on the side as well. And she was very happy with this result. Another uh, important part of uh, facial aging is, is uh, often that people don't think of is a rhinoplasty surgery. What, what happens is uh, your, your nose uh, tends to lose support and uh, get more droopy over time. Um, and a lot of patients like to address that. And uh, again, we can do this um, uh, to uh, a rhinoplasty, essentially reshape the nose. Uh, then incisions uh, can often be hidden within the nose, but in a lot of cases we have to do what's called an open rhinoplasty, which means a small incision here along that skin bridge uh, between the nostrils. Um, and uh, this is often used for better visualization and to get the best result, uh, something we would talk about in your consultation. Um, 
in terms of recovery, I will say for the nose, the swelling is the biggest thing. It, the swelling does last longer. Um, you know, it's significant for the first six weeks, um, but uh, it lasts much longer than that, than that. It takes a full year for the nose to fully heal. Uh, most of the swelling got, is gone, however, at uh, three to four months. Um, uh, most people feel presentable, though, at six weeks, so I think that's important to keep in mind. And here's just an example of a male patient who uh, was getting that kind of droopier tip he was unhappy with, and we're able to, to get it up. But it's not, he's a male, you never want to over make it too upturned. Um, I think it's really important also to make sure it's not scooped for a male, um, which we were able to achieve for him. So now I wanted to talk about some of the latest advances uh, in facial rejuvenation and some of the more common things we're doing uh, in, uh, in this uh, field. Um, so fat grafting has become more and more important in, uh, in terms of uh, addressing uh, uh, facial rejuvenation. And it's kind of not just a lift concept, it's a lift and fill concept where as I said, we have a loss of uh, facial fat, especially around the cheeks, uh, and really different parts of the body too. Sometimes the temples also, um, this region here, uh, is, uh, is affected as well. And so fat grafting has been a great tool where essentially we take a little bit of fat from most commonly your flanks or your belly or wherever you have it. And a lot of our patients are really happy about this part of being able to remove some from there. It's not a large volume. It's not like liposuction, but it does remove some. And then we, we uh, process it and then um, uh, put it in your, into the right regions of your um, face um, to kind of reverse some of the, the uh, fat that you lost. Um, this has uh, been a great tool. This is some of the research we've done on it um, that I've been involved with. And uh, it's, it's something that uh, um, is being done more and more commonly. Uh, and it's in, in your own tissue, and it can often replace ever having to need fillers again. So it's an important thing, and it should be something to talk about with your surgeon as a potential option if you're seeking uh, facial rejuvenation. Another new advance is something called Kybella. It's a, um, actually taking an enzyme that's naturally produced uh, in your gallbladder and using that to dissolve uh, fat, just like we have to digest food uh, in our, sorry, digest fat in our GI tract. We are, we're using it to kind of melt away fat in the right places, and it's, used, uh, it's FDA approved now to treat with the submental fat. It does little to address excess skin, so it works best in patients that only have the fat and not excess skin. It's not a replacement for face and uh, neck lifts and or um, uh, isolated neck lifts, so it's important to keep that in mind. Um, it typically takes about three treatments to get the desired result, um, and it's about $1,300 per treatment. Just to give you a comparison, another option often for patients is neck lipo. It's done in one, and it costs roughly about four thousand in terms of um, surgeon's fee. So, this is a if you're if, for someone who's really afraid of uh, uh, going under the knife, this is an option. Um, and here's a uh, result of a before and after of, of using Kybella. But notice she's younger and has not a lot of excess skin, just some excess fat in that area, and uh, we're able to give her a nice result. It's another view of the same patient. So I wanted to go over some of the facial rejuvenation myths. Um, there's uh, uh, things called like thermage, non-surgical facelifts, the mini facelift, uh, lunchtime facelift. These are, you know, one thing I like to say is mini lifts give uh, equals a mini results. So you, you, you know, biology is biology, and there's no way to uh, change that aspect. So if uh, something really has such little downtime and is really too good to be true, it, it probably doesn't work essentially, and, and these things come and go, um, uh, come just as fast as they go, and uh, and it's for good reason. You know, uh, patients you know pay a good amount of money for this, and really uh, often are um, you know don't get the result that they're looking for. So in general, I would say in medicine, it's often best to go with tried and true methods. Um, let the experimental stuff or the stuff that sounds really high technology and, and brand new, uh, it's not always the best option. And people always love lasers, uh, considered high tech and, and a better solution. Yes, there's a great technology in lasers, and sometimes it is a great solution. But really, it's, it's um, as I tried to give uh, examples of before, it's just uh, heat energy um, and has you know, a similar effect as chemical peels and or dermabrasion. Um, so it can be the right call um, and treatment for certain situations. Uh, but just because it's a laser doesn't make it uh, better. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my presentation. If you have any more questions or you want to contact us, please visit my website at drjasonplastsurgery.com. Thank you so much.